So the starting point of this study is an observation, namely that Mises, Mises and Rothbard's analysis of interventionism uh, uh, is characterized, among other things, by the fact that labor factors typically find themselves on both sides of the redistributive process implied in interventions among the winners and the losers, that is. There are, of course, good reasons for that, uh, namely that, uh, contra Marx, uh, we know that there is nothing exploitative per se uh, in labor contracts, uh, at least since Bomba work, we know that there are good economic reasons why there would be a gap between the price of the product and the price of uh, labor factors, namely that there is an intertemporal exchange uh, between wage earners and the capitalists. And we also know from a legal point of view that there is no, nothing uh, aggressive in a labor contract. So, um, so that's why exploitation is not involved in a labor contract. However, uh, we could still wonder if some interventions might make wage earners gather on the side of losers, while at least some capitalists would gain, would gain in the process. Uh, this paper basically provides an answer to that question. So the first thing I did uh, to find uh, any kind of answer was to check uh, my favorite book, Human Action, uh, to see what Mises had to say. And I found that Mises claims, I quote, the, the employers would be in a position enabling them to lower wage rates by concerted action only if they were to monopolize a factor indispensable for every kind of production and to restrict the employment of this factor in a monopolistic way. As there is no single material factor indispensable for every kind of production, they would have to monopolize all material factors of production. This condition would be present only in a socialist community. So this implies, well, of course, that there could be no such thing as uh, labor factors paid under their marginal productivity in a free market, at least not temporarily, but also in a hampered market society, since he says only in a socialist community uh, such a uh, combination of employers could succeed in bringing lower wages. So this is Mises' thesis. However, well, I will, I will not quarrel with Mises on uh, the idea that uh, on, um, what he described, re, uh, describes regarding the uh, effects of a state-owned economy. Uh, where uh, I would have, I would beg to differ is on the, his implied idea that uh, this cannot happen under interventionism, that is under a hamper, in a hampered market society. So I want to show here that there is no need to monopolize all factors of production to bring about an overall relative lowering of prices for original factors, in particular labor factors, compared to what would prevail in a free market environment. And I want to explain how grants of monopolistic privileges to capitalists in a hampered market economy can be sufficient to lower labor and land factor prices. I also want to explain how this conclusion can be viewed as an implication of Rothbard's own work on monopoly theory. So in order to do so, I will first recall the basic tenets of Rothbard's theory, and then uh, I will draw the implications regarding factor pricing. So first, Rothbard's monopoly price theory in a nutshell. There are basically, uh, in order for a monopoly price to emerge, according to Rothbard, there are basically three requirements. The first is one needs a monopoly, of course. Uh, monopoly is here defined as, and uh, Rothbard quotes a 17th century lawyer named Lord Coke, 
uh, monopolize uh, the institution or allowance by the king, by his grant commission or otherwise to any person or persons, bodies, political or corporate, for the sole buying, selling, making, working or using of anything whereby any person or persons, bodies, political or corporate, are sought to be restrained of any freedom or liberty that they had before or hindered in their lawful trade. Mm. Uh, actually, this is also valid I mean, in the Rosbardian framework. Uh, it, does it does not necessarily have to be a king who would grant the privilege or a king or a democratic ruler. It can also be um, granted through private threats of aggression. The relevant criterion is the presence of, aggress the, uh, of an aggressive behavior that hamper the competitive process. Uh, second thing, despite the fact that the definition uh, is large and includes not only restriction on selling but restrictions on buying, Rosbard focuses on what we call monopoly of supply, so monopoly uh, in selling. Which brings me to the second requirement for uh, monopoly price to emerge. Uh, the second requirement is that the market demand for the considered good has to be inelastic, uh, which simply means that above the free market price, uh, buyers would be ready to buy less units, of course, but uh, they would be ready to spend more money. The third requirement is that there would be one seller, only one seller, or an agreement between uh, sellers. That is, they would, uh, they, could, they would agree so that they would act as if they were only one. Then they would be in a position to profit from the second requirement, inelasticity of demand. What are the consequences? Uh, simple. Uh, monopoly price implies that consumers are hurt because of the higher price they have to pay for a lower available supply of the product and because of the corresponding misallocation of factors in the economy. This is uh, pretty straightforward and it has been stated a hundred times, not only in Mises and Rothbard, but in uh, practically every work on the issue. However, neither Rothbard nor Mises, for that matter, are very explicit regarding factor pricing under these monopolistic conditions. And as far as distributive effects on incomes are concerned, Rothbard only stresses the monopoly gain accruing to the holder of the privilege. And this additional net income seems to be entirely extracted from people as consumers. So, starting from there, uh, let's see what, uh, sh what are the implications for factor pricing that uh, Rothbard did not explicit. I believe there are two key elements to take into consideration. Uh, first, when coercion bars some existing or would-be capitalists to sell a product, this ipso facto bars them from renting or buying the, factor, the factors required in its production, and vice versa. In other words, we do not only have here a monopoly of supply for the product, we also have a mon monopoly, what economists were calling monopoly of demand for its factors. And today uh, it's usually called monopsony. Uh, what I claim here is that when we focus on uh, producers who buy and sell, that is when we focus on capitalists, monopoly of supply and monopoly of demand are the two sides of the same monopoly coin. Actually, Wieser uh, hinted at this in his treatise uh, Social Economics when he stated that, I quote, it seems impossible to imagine a combination of circumstances where a demand monopoly does not also amount to a monopoly of supply. And he also gives an example where, uh, which shows 
the, it works also the other way around. Now, what is the, the direct implication about, uh, from that? Uh, it should be clear that uh, all this implies a downward pressure on factor prices in the monopolized sector. Uh, the reason is uh, since uh, buyers of their service, some buyers of their services are excluded from the market, uh, the monopolists would be able to pay them below their marginal productivity level. Uh, and to contemplate why, why this uh, should be the case, uh, we can uh, we can think about the condition that would be required for it not to be the case. The condition would be that the, sup the supply schedule of the factor would be purely elastic. However, we know uh, thanks to Rosbard again, that this is impossible. This is only in the, in the neoclassical land of uh, pure and perfect competition that we find this. Since uh, pure and perfect competition cannot exist, uh, it means that the, the supply schedules have to be elastic. As a consequence, it allows the monopolists to, uh, to obtain a lower price for the factor. The second key insight is that when a monopolist takes advantage of an inelastic demand for the good it sells, this implies lower spending from its buyers on other goods. Uh, I refer here to Rosbard's discussion in Man, Economy and State, I think it's chapter 4, on the interdependence between markets, where if someone buys more somewhere, necessarily, he has to spend less elsewhere. And uh, the monopoly price, the monopoly uh, situation implies that the buyers spend more on the monopolized goods, so they have to spend less elsewhere. So the direct consequence is that the price of these goods uh, for which the demand shrink will be lowered. And then it means that the marginal productivity schedule of the factors which help in its uh, production will fall too, and then their, price, their prices will fall too. So here we have the two legs of my argument. Overall, the pressure on factor prices coming from inside and outside of the monopolized sector is downward. There are differences depending on the specificity of each uh, factor, their position in the whole structure of production. Uh, I will not tell you about all the details because it's quite complicated, and, uh, but it's in the paper, so if you're interested, uh, you can ask me and I will uh, send you a copy. Okay, so other implications. First, uh, the monopoly gain of the holder of privilege does not come only from the consumers, but also from the factor he employs, including capital goods. However, capitalist net returns in earlier stages of production do not have to decrease. As with the sales tax shifted backward, the lower prices for capital goods will translate into lower demands and prices for original factors involved in their production, and the margins could stay the same. So, uh, I refer here to Rosbard's discussion about the sales tax in power and market. This is ex exactly the same effect. Lower prices for capital goods are imputed backward to original factors of production, land and labor factors. Now, uh, um, I, to I told you about this idea of an over overall downward pressure, but there might be an objection which is correct. Uh, it is not true that each and every factor must see its uh, price uh, diminish. The reason is that we, uh, the monopolists, the gain of the monopolist will be spent too. And this could make some uh, factor prices rise in the sector where he spends. 
The other reason is uh, the other reasons is that there are some sectors expanding because of the factors displaced from the monopolized sector and factors that are complementary to these uh, displaced factors would then be in higher demand, so they could uh, have a higher price. But these are exceptions. And in any case, there can, be, there can hardly be any doubt about the aggregate impact on original factor prices. We know from Rosbard again, a discussion, macroeconomic discussion in the chapters on the structure, structure of production, um, we know that net income in the economy over a period of time equals consumption spending for this period. Given time preferences and uh, de demand and supply schedules for money, which have no reason to change, aggregate consumption spending stays the same with or without uh, the monopoly grants. But then, for the monopolist to gain an additional net monetary income compared to what he would earn on the free market, other incomes have to be curtailed in the same process of production or in other. Um, the, the thing is, the, the original interest rate and uh, investment spending do not need to be altered. Therefore, interest income is unaltered and land and labor factors must bear the brunt. Though some of them may gain in the process, true, aggregate land and labor income must be reduced as a counterpart to the existence of a monopoly gain somewhere. And since the stock of labor and land has no reason to be different, this implies an overall downward, uh, an overall tendency toward lower prices for these factors. Finally, there is an empirical consideration that we also know from Rosbard, uh, which is that labor factors tend to be more, uh, tend to be non-specific compared to land factors. The implication in the context of this discussion is that the downward pressure on original factor prices might be more widespread for labor factors. So, um, I think I will conclude there. Uh, the general implication I want to stress uh, in the spirit of uh, Hans Hopper's article that was called Marxist and Austrian Class Analysis, which uh, has been republished, I think, in his book uh, Economics and Ethics of Private Property. Uh, in, the, in this spirit, uh, it should be clear that insofar as Austrian criticisms of the Marxist theory of surplus value are correct, it does not follow that one should throw out the exploitation of labor baby with the Marxist bathwater. Under monopoly, land and especially labor can indeed be exploited in the sense that they can be paid under their free market level as a consequence of coercion. And the corresponding redistribution in favor of some capitalists implies in turn a relative proletarianization of some workers. Uh, these are basically the laborers whose lower wages are not compensated by higher incomes coming from some investments in the privileged sectors, either because their monopoly gains are not high enough uh, or because they have no money invested in these sectors or because the gains have already been capitalized before they came, or even because they are not investors at all, which can be the case of the lowest paid uh, workers. I think a sociological insight follows. With a lower total monetary income, uh, workers are less likely to present themselves as investors on the time markets, and the distribution of catalytic functions be among people tends to become more rigid. So laborers stay laborers, capitalists stay capitalists. Uh, last thing I want to mention uh, are about, uh, is about uh, the further researches that could be valuable, uh, starting from what I've just said. Uh, first, to do some applied economics or history in the field, I think... Uh, it would, it would be necessary to have 
an analysis of interactions between these monopolistic grants and other interventions in the market that may conceivably compound their effects or counteract each other to some extent. Then, with such a big picture, big theoretical picture, we would then be able to make an empirical assessment of how far monopoly and exploitation of original factors went in the real world, past and present. Thanks for your attention.